All right, everybody, got a uh, few wonderful guests here for you today. Uh, so glad to have Mary McCartney. She's the Director of Corporate Communications for Con Ed. And as you all know, COVID uh, really hit New York pretty hard. And so these folks are really at the epicenter. I think she's going to have a lot of interesting things for us to, uh, to share with us today. A little bit about Mary. Uh, she leads a team of corporate communications professionals responsible for well, media relations, digital communications, and internal and external communications for the company that powers New York City, Westchester, Rockland, and Orange Counties. She oversees messaging for the company's major corporate initiatives, including the clean energy future, smart meters, and advances in technology. This is my favorite part. Prior to joining Conness in 1999, Mary was chief of customer, customer information at New York City Transit, where she was responsible for marketing and uh, customer information programs and helped launch the Metro card. So if you've ever used those Metro cards on the subway, uh, Mary played a big part of that. A lifetime, lifelong New Yorker, Mary began her career as a legislative aide for the New York City Council, where she handled constituent complaints, but that was fun, owned her interest in customer service, she issued the first council report exploring <laughs> homeless women as part of her focus on health care in the city. Uh, Mary serves on the executive committee of the conference board's corporate communications council. She also she earned a bachelor's degree in American history from the University of Chicago, but is a lifelong New Yorker. Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to, to be here to speak to everybody. I, I, I think one of the best parts of our industry to Con Edison has been performing during the pandemic. Why don't we run through a few slides uh, and then our customers and our community. So um, as Jay mentioned in New York, we are kind of in the belly of the beast with the um, pandemic. Um, this just gives you a quick sense of the timeline of the start uh, of all this, um, I can tell you that the, um, the first Con Edison employee to, um, to test positive was March 17th. Pandemic, pandemic team uh, is composed of representatives from corporate affairs, that's myself, so I'm representing um, communications and our government um, relations group, as well as our strategic partnership group. Um, our EHNS team, emergency preparedness, uh, supply chain, labor relations, employee wellness center, uh, field services, uh, law, and human resources. And we also have representatives from our commodities, gas, electric, and steam as well. We, the fundamentals that we follow in our, uh, for a pandemic team is to follow CDC recommendations, to benchmark uh, and uh, look for best practices, to use our employee wellness center. We have a um, fabulous nurse practitioner who is an infectious disease specialist. Um, we establish guidelines for quarantine for backtracing and return to work guidance. We use Connor, which is our intranet site, as a repository for all our information. And we direct employees to our frequently asked questions on Connor. We also established a pandemic hotline and email mailbox for employee feedback. And as always, and as everyone on this call uh, knows, we um, communicate and over communicate as much as possible. Jess, can we look at the next slide, please? Thank you. This is a quick snapshot of Connor, which is uh, um, our intranet site. I can't tell you that the, um, I can't tell, underline enough how important our intranet site and having a good one um, in good shape has been to this whole uh, communication effort. We put about a million and a half dollars into improving our very outdated and clunky um, intranets better than expected. 
this time around. Um, you can see on the right that we have, um, you know, how do I find, and that lets us put the COVID information um, every day, and that allows us to push the, uh, the work of our employees there as well. Um, we have a much better, much more agile homepage, streamlined navigation, and a really good search. Um, and it has been one of the most important channels for us during this entire uh, crisis. Jess, can we go to the next slide, please? This just gives you a sense of what our, our uh, COVID-19 FAQ site looks like. Right now, um, we've got up there the, um, uh, you know, the guidelines for exposure and testing. An enormous amount of work went into um, coming up with the right guidelines. Again, following the CDC recommendations. Um, online, or you can also, it's easy to download it. As we're starting re-entry, we've got re-entry information in, message information that becomes very important um, in these types of crises. Um, we have and flow charts that can help them understand if you test positive, what are the next steps? If one of your colleagues tests positive, what are the next steps? When can you return? Um, what does that look like? So we really spell everything here. Uh, can we go to the next slide, Jess? Okay, so this is uh, for customers. Um, we're, we, we've been very straightforward. We've taken um, the steps that uh, I think most, uh, most of us in this business have taken. If we're in a site with a lot of illness, we've, um, we've suspended uh, turnoffs. Uh, during the crisis, uh, we suspended um, late payments. We've suspended meter reading. We've start our, stopped our smart meter installation. Um, we uh, got rid of late payment fees. Uh, we did all those things to help our customers feel more uh, comfortable and to help ensure our employee safety and comfort as, as well. At the same time, we sent out um, you know, really helpful information for people recognizing that more of our customers are well all of our customers are working from home if you're not an essential worker right now um and and being aware that that uh people were going to be going going to be getting estimated bills save, save energy and save money um just as an aside we've also recently done a, a, a very quick online customer survey asking our customers as we are starting to re-enter just this week, in fact, you know, what are the what are the things they're going to be looking for, expecting from Con Edison employees? And that's proved very helpful in in um, in uh, reassuring them that yes, we will we will be wearing masks and uh, gloves as we are um, placed. Uh, just a quick snapshot of some of the social media. We we did a um, sort of a thank you. Um, uh, shout out to employees. We have not been pushing that. Always best for that information to come from customers themselves. Um, so we share that wherever we get it. Uh, what we really pushed with video and social media are stories of um, what employees are doing to help. And on the right there, you've got um, a story about our, our machine shop up at Van Nest in the Bronx that um, switched to manufacturing face shields that we donated to healthcare workers in Westchester County. We got a lot of nice play on that in the media as well as in social media. Um, at the same time, we've also uh, let people know that um, we've donated um, um, over $100,000 uh, to uh, various uh, food um, supply organizations. We've donated to the Mayor's Fund, to the uh, New York Police Department, and uh, New York Fire Department funds and our employees have uh, the personally donated over $100,000 to different organizations and the company has matched that dollar for dollar. Next slide, please, Jess. And at the same time, just, uh, was it last week, I guess, last week? Um, kind of lose track of time. Uh, you know, life continues and we're just this morning, as a matter of fact, we have our government relations team 
at the New York City Council testifying about our summer preparations, um, talking about our uh, clean energy future, uh, talking about the investments we've made in our system um, to support reliability and safety, um, talking about uh, uh, the customer assistance that we provided, and also pointing to the fact that uh, for a variety of reasons, we, um, we are looking at summer bills being higher this year. Next slide, Jess. And we have um, started our, or we'll be starting this week, our phase one um, reentry, which is moving more of our uh, field personnel um, who have been associated with postponed work. It's work that we're allowed to do under the current state uh, guidelines, but we um, pulled back in some instance, uh, instances in an abundance of caution. Uh, for instance, we have about 80% uh, of our electric uh, field uh, crews working already. This week, we'll be bringing it up to 100%. Uh, we'll, bringing it, we'll be bringing in more gas crews. Um, over the next few weeks, we'll start uh, reading um, outdoor meters, uh, eventually then meter banks, and with a look towards, uh, towards the end of the summer, of um, returning to uh, customers' homes to read uh, indoor meters. Uh, and we're also restarting our, um, our smart meter insta installation. We're also um, resuming some training that we had suspended uh, over the last three months. Uh, and we're gonna keep a very close eye on everything, obviously, um, as we're going through this, and we're gonna be keeping a very close look, obviously, on. Uh, just today, Governor Cuomo announced uh, New York Forward, which is starting to slowly open up the state. Uh, and our look ahead at this point for phase two would start in, in September, uh, where we will start bringing back some remote uh, workers whose work would benefit from working in the workplace, but continuing to ask uh, people who can work from home to do so. Um, and we have a, a whole array that we're starting this week as well uh, to uh, continue to endorse and uh, enforce uh, social distancing, um, you know, allowing people to use um, additional uh, company cars for transportation, um, you know, working with crews so we don't have two people in a truck wherever we can, um, we can avoid that, um, a whole array of those, those sorts of health and hygiene issues. When people are returning, um, employees are returning this week, they'll be getting um, sort of a field kit of health and hygiene information and masks, gloves, hand sanitizers, wipes, instruction sheets, a thermometer, um, you know, a variety of information to help them, uh, you know, reintegrate. Then long term for phase three, we're really looking at, uh, at some time in 2021, um, where we will be getting more external um, medical triggers that will help us bring more people back to the workplace. Uh, next slide, please, Jess. Just a quick reminder, we, um, I, I would urge you to, uh, to have your graphics team start working on a uh, sign manual as easy as possible. Uh, Jess, you can go to the next slide also. Uh, you know, we, we all want to, you want to establish uh, consistent messages and designs for all of your facilities um, before um, individual artwork starts popping, popping up. And the last slide, Jess. Thank you. So this, this uh, made us feel good last week. Uh, last week. On the left, there's it's a photo um, that we clipped from a video that we did early on um, to promote social distancing um, on uh, you know, safety briefings and then any other activity in the field among our crews. And on the right is a, uh, a, a tweet we saw last week um, from one of our customers saying, yep, they noticed uh, our crews standing in a circle six feet apart, everybody uh, wearing masks. And the kids noticed too. So that was that we kind of gave ourselves a pat on the back when we saw that. So that's just very big picture, very quickly. Um, uh, Jay, you know, the, some of the things that we've been working on, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think that's the first time a utility's ever gotten credit for anything, Mary. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, Mary, I, I did. I, 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 I got my start professionally as an intern at New York One News. In fact, uh, Philip, mm -hmm. there it is, kept this with me my, the entire <laughs> journey. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the crises that you've dealt with in the past compared to this. Now, yes, COVID is a crisis, but let's think about a lot of the things that you've dealt with that really hit Con Ed. The 2003 blackout, 9-11, Hurricane Sandy, all these winter storms that you have all the time. <laughs> it's not a crisis of reliability. It's a crisis that's going on, but really as Con Ed, you really have the ability to say, hey, we have this, keep calm, carry on. You know, the healthcare workers are definitely taxed, but that's not Con Ed's crisis. Am I onto something there? Uh, no, very, uh, very much so, Jay. This, this is the, I was involved of all and, uh, and a few more. Um, and this is the first time that this has really been, our focus has really been, you know, 85% internal um, on employees. Externally, we're not the story and we don't want to be the story. Um, we, we want to, you know, we, we, we took actions early on um, to help customers with bills, um, to help them with their sense of safety and, uh, you know, staying safe and healthy by withdrawing um, a lot of work uh, from the street in their homes. And we have, you know, donated to our communities. We, what the, the, the stories that we promote are the stories of um, how we have helped um, build some of the field hospitals in Central Park or in the Javits Center, um, how we've helped power the testing stations around the city, how are the crew that I mentioned in Van Nest, um, you know, on their own, um, figured out how they could how they could switch the work they're doing um, and start uh, creating a field uh, face shields for healthcare workers. So all of us in this industry, we all know we've got you know no one tells our story better than you know the people who who work uh, you know work for our companies, and we've got a lot of good stories to tell, and that's what we that's what we've relied on. You mentioned uh, that Con Ed, a lot of other utilities have relaxed, relaxed overdue collections. Uh, how are you managing the public's expectations with that without uh, really getting into some financial trouble? I mean, yeah, we're going to relax collections. That doesn't mean it's forgiven. Um, it doesn't seem like the, the stock price is really taking a hit on that. It seems like eventually everyone will be made whole, but what are you doing externally about that and those expectations for the public? Well, we, we um, I, I, I haven't gotten notes from, uh, as I said, we had a, a city council hearing this morning, which may in fact still be going on. Um, and we anticipated getting asked that and we're just going to reassure everyone that we don't see any change in our, um, uh, you know, uh, those customer assistance moves that we made, um, you know, in the immediate future. So, um, you know, certainly through through the rest of the summer. Uh, I'm curious what prepares you for something like this. Again, you know, it, it being New York, I'm sure you were dealing with viral, you know, virus issues, but probably, you know, the New York take on it would be something like a chemical attack, you know, like a something like that. So, did you have anything in the playbook about a pandemic where basically everybody is sheltering in place? What did you have kind of um, worked out already? Yeah. No, we ha we have actually. Um, the pandemic team was started. Um, what I can say is that we you know, we went through as everyone did scares with um, SARS and avian flu and, and Ebola. And we're New York, so we have people from all over the world and we have employees who uh, come from all over the world. Um, so we we had sort of the basics in our, in our pandemic plan, the basics of following CDC guidelines, you know, how to communicate with employees. Um, nothing prepared us completely for this, but because we had the plan, we were able to react quickly and put a number of procedures into place 
um, very quickly. And we, you know, we have a very um, robust dashboard, for instance, that the pandemic team put together. So we track every employee who test is, uh, who tests positive, um, every employee who is out on quarantine, every employee who is returning from being ill, every uh, employee who's you know, returning from quarantine, we know when, when they should be back, we stay in touch with them, um, we stay engaged with them. Um, and as we're going into, uh, we're still in ICS, but as we're looking at instead of having an 8 a.m. call every morning, maybe going to that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, we're very much keeping our eye on um, what the numbers will look like in the fall, where um, you know uh, most medical experts expect a, um, a return, uh, a spike in numbers again. You know, Mary, uh, I was I was talking to uh, Philip O'Brien, who's also on your team, about this idea of um, so. Uh, look, I mean, as as a utility, your job is to keep the lights on, but there's sometimes a little bit of a schism going on between what the government officials want. They want everybody to shelter in place, say, you know, safety, 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 health, health, health. And then you've got a lot of business owners now who are kind of pushing back a little bit on this idea of staying, uh, staying out of business, you know, indefinitely. Are you finding yourself in that discussion, that daylight maybe between business owners and uh, the public officials who are saying like, look, this is for safety, safety. We need to, uh, shelter in place. Uh, where where does Con Ed come in on that uh, in that discussion? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that we're in the reopening discussion in in that way. Um, you know, we we see our responsibility, our job to you know provide safe and reliable power um, as the city and uh, Westchester County um, and Orange and Rockland counties, you know, emerge and reopen um, and, you know, make sure that we've got uh, a plan. Um, you know, we know that this summer, the commercial centers in Manhattan will have a much lower uh, uh, load and demand than they have, than, you know, we have in the past and we see, that demand will be higher in a lot of our residential networks, but we have put um, a lot of money into the system as we do every year. Um, and we have all sorts of contingency plans with mobile generators if necessary. Um, you can probably see me knocking on wood as we speak. Um, so we're, I, I, we, we're, we're really not in the, um, I mean, we part of all sorts of discussions, but we don't see a problem providing um, services whatever they will be, whatever the business community will need. Sure. And look, I think that's the happy side of the ledger, right? I think that, um, you know, utilities, telecoms, uh, Netflix, those guys are really, you guys are kind of on the, the part that's stable and, you know, our hearts go out to everybody else who's fight on the front lines of this fight and everything. And so uh, this has really been very educational, I'm sure, for everybody here who's listening in, especially you guys dealing on the front line. No city is quite like New York. And uh, we certainly um, look forward to seeing uh, how, how this progresses, you know, especially as you start to reopen. Uh, Mary, I, right. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, for coming on and talking to us. Thank you, Jay. You bet. Thank you. And thank you, Philip O'Brien, for setting this up. And again, this is how I got started. <laughs> So uh, it's been fun to, uh, to reconnect. Philip actually started New York One News. I did my internship in the summer of 2001, just to date myself a little bit. So, uh, but um, no, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. And from- When this is over, come back and visit. I I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Diane, <laughs> we're now at the bottom of the hour. Off to you, uh, Diane Chase. Many of you at E4 may know Diane. She is the Senior Vice President for C4CS, a strategic communications and crisis management firm. She is an award-winning media journalism and communication professional with profound experience in various communications disciplines, most notably crisis communication. Uh, she is also an experienced issue and reputation management consultant, media trainer, presenter, and writer. 
She has extensive experience in crisis communication, management, response, and training in the energy industry. And uh, Diane, we are really excited to hear from you and your guests. So I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Jay. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. And I'm really thrilled to be able to have some time to share some conversation with an outstanding crisis communication expert, Denise Swernley. Denise is Vice President of Communications at Flamatome Incorporated. She's based at their North American headquarters in Lynchburg, Virginia, and she leads their North American communications to engage internal and external stakeholders in the company's strategies, initiatives, and successes. She has a long career in the energy industry. She started when she was 12. Right. <laughs> Thanks, and, uh, I love the quote, the really succinct quote from your LinkedIn profile I, I snagged this morning. Communication is about the right messages to the right people at the right time using the right tools. And that's what I do best. Perfect. So we met originally, I think, when I was president of the Charlotte chapter of the International Association of Business Communicators. Mm -hmm. And Denise also has been very involved with IABC in Virginia as well. So we, we're really passionate about IABC. If anyone wants to talk about that, let us know. We're happy to do it. So thank you so much, Denise, for taking some time to be with us today and share some wisdom in terms of your response to COVID-19. We'd love to just start off by asking you to share the moment you actually learned and realized that this was a, a pandemic that was having a global and escalating impact. Can you kind of take us there at the moment you realized and, and heard about this? Sure. It was sort of a evolving revelation, I think, probably like for most people, um, until it just truly hit home right at, you know, in our company and our, our location. But we were, you know, hearing about it in January and February. We had a, um, a fairly large communications meeting planned in Paris uh, the first week of February. I think I left the Monday after Super Bowl. And uh, we had some discussion over the weekend about, well, should we really be going? And what's the risk? And there was a lot of dialogue with our risk analysis folks and our colleagues in Paris and what's going on there. And uh, in the end, we decided to go, and um, the airplane was about 25% full, which was amazing. Um, I've never wow. seen like that on that flight. Yeah, our domestic flights were full. It was the international flight that mm. was was um, really um, low. And on the way back, it was I think I could see two people from my seat um, on the way back. So even even less travel coming back. So that kind of reflected, I think, people's feelings about international travel in particular. Um, and then about two or three weeks later, we had a conference in Canada. And again, we had discussion about whether we go or not and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we did. And that conference was at full capacity, the best attendance it ever had, but really strong messaging around prevention there um, and a lot more caution. And then by the time we got home from that conference, it was, I think, the next week. Um, that's when it became clear that it was spreading into North America and that we were going to have to be um, more vigilant uh, and more proactive. And then I think it was the week of March, um, right that first week of March heading into the second week when we decided that uh, we needed everybody to work remotely who could. And, and it just happened very fast. I mean, the decision was made on a Wednesday or a Thursday and we communicated to our teams and sent everybody to work from home pretty quickly. Um, so there was not much of a ramp down from working in the office to working remotely. Um, mm -hmm. It happened pretty quickly. But, and then we started the, you know, then the crisis team came together. There's six of us on the crisis management team and uh, that formed pretty quickly and, and ramped up very fast with daily meetings and report outs and, and that type of thing. So. Fantastic. And that's such a, an important point. I'd love to hear more about that in terms of your your preparation what sort of preparation in terms of your crisis management team your planning and training did you have a pandemic scenario in there we did have a pandemic crisis plan in our playbook if you will it had not been updated in years i think it was from the sars um pandemic 
Um, so that was there. It needed a lot of updating. The folks who created it um, and sort of managed it over the years are long moved on to other companies and other roles and they've just kind of been sitting there gathering dust. So we did pull that out. From a crisis communications perspective, um, you know, I would say, I don't know that I, I don't remember ever doing a drill or a exercise or training specifically for a pandemic scenario. Um, it's usually been other types of scenarios. But again, I think the principles of good crisis communication are coming to play in a pandemic just as much as, as anything else. There are some nuances, of course, but the principles are still there. I always say if you have the right people in the room, you're gonna to get to the right answers or at least good answers. Um, so having a loose plan is helpful and then having the right people in the room I think is, is critical. So that's really, um, you know, that's really how our communications kicked off is pulling that crisis team together, a quick review of our pandemic um, plan and started updating that. That was being updated simultaneous to managing the crisis itself. So they were mm -hmm. kind of happening together at the same time. Oh, wow, yeah. So can you share with us some more details about your exact response, um, your key messages, your outreach, your engagement? Of course, as we know, um, especially now more than ever in terms of uh, crisis communication response, compassion, clarity, mm -hmm. consistency, you know, establishing that cadence, making sure the content is, is always level set, right? So um, yeah. maybe some of your key messages. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, our tone from the beginning was to establish um, transparency with our employees, to be very transparent and to be very open uh, with our employees about, you know, what was going on. We knew before we had our first case that when we did, we would be very open with our employees about what was going on and trying to strike the right balance between protecting the privacy of the employee um, and being able to share with our, our folks, you know, that we had a case. So um, we did a pretty good job, I think, of establishing that from the very beginning. And we've got a lot of positive feedback from our employees just saying, hey, really appreciate the transparency um, that you guys are having. So that, that was key for us. Um, you know, our messages were um, around in the beginning, um, it's an evolving scenario, it's an evolving situation, and we are monitoring it. Uh, we're monitoring what our customers are doing and saying, which are utilities, electric utilities. Uh, and then we're also monitoring the CDC, and then we're monitoring the state um, health departments in states where we have facilities. So very clear that, um, you know, we were in tune with recommendations and um, actions. And then as orders, you know, official orders were declared in the states, making sure we were on top of those and how it affected our workforce. So um, a lot of um, reassurance, I think, along those lines. And then also making sure that our folks understood that we had to strike the right balance between um, sustaining business and the health and safety of our employees. So that was an important message um, for, especially for our employees who, you know, they understood we needed to protect them and protect our workforce, but they also understood they'd still like to have a job a year from now. Um, and sustaining the business was an important part of that. So um, that was a key message for us as well, um, is that sustainability of the business. And you know, where we had a spring outage season, so we sent, I think, 900 people out into nuclear power plants during this time to do work at the plants. Um, and so some really specific communications for those folks. So we had our own precautions that we wanted people to take and then we had to know for every nuclear power plant to which we sent people, what are they requiring and what are their messages um, in aligning with those as well. So um, a lot of effort into making sure those folks who deployed for the outage season um, were hearing the right things and knew what was expected and then managing them when they came back. So we also had a message, you know, around the importance of protecting our families of our employees and our communities. You know, we didn't want these people coming back into our community and bringing the virus with them to their families and then, you know, throughout the community. This has certainly not been a hot spot here. We've been very fortunate that way. So managing that correctly too, and making sure people knew that we were doing that. 
what were the most effective channels? And also, did you have several spokespeople and did the CEO actually have any direct communication? Did you do town halls? Can you share anything about that? Yeah, good question. We established tools very quickly up front um, because we knew we could have great we could have great messages and information. If we didn't have the right tools, we were you know not going to get them to the right people. Um, so we established some tools pretty quickly. You know, probably the standard that everybody else did of a special banner for email um, that made it very clear that this was about coronavirus to get people's attention, so it stood out from our normal communication. And then uh, an internet page, we got an internet page up very quickly for our employees um, and got some basic structure in place um, to make that easy to navigate. And then that just kind of grew and filled in over time. Um, so those are our two key tools for, for internal communication. Um, and then a guide for managers was the other thing. So we did a strong call to our managers that this is the time to step up as leaders and help your people understand what's happening and know what's expected of them and then know what to expect too from the company. Um, so that was the strong call out to leadership. Um, for customers, our CEO of our parent company in France did a message to very high level customers, CEOs of our utility customers. Uh, and then our CEO for our North America company, um, we sent a message from him to a broader audience. And again, sort of a special look and feel to this piece, um, but still written as a letter and a message from him um, to our customers. And then we have a, a web page up that um, talks to our customers about solutions and things that may be more useful or relevant to them during this time, um, more from a marketing perspective. So, and then we really got some key messages, again, relying on other people who have connections we relied on our customer facing people, our sales folks, to deliver messages to our customers as well. So very quickly, we got out a set of talking points for them about what we were doing and how we were reacting, and what they could expect from us um, as a um, provider to them uh, during the pandemic. And, um, and they very quickly aligned around that. So we had a really solid message block, I would say, internally and externally in multiple channels some more personal um, than, than others, which I think was, was quite helpful. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of my mantras is lead with empathy, especially in a crisis, mm -hmm. right? Um, did, how much did you use video? Did you use Zoom a lot or how was that handled? Uh, Zoom was very quickly blocked by our IT people when they had their early issues, um, but we do have uh, an internal Skype software uh, and that was, normally we use that for sharing slides um, and we quickly retooled to use that for both audio and uh, video um, for internal meetings and then quickly thereafter for external um, capability as well. Um, our CEO in France uh, did a message to employees about every Monday um, to all the global employees. Um, very well done, expressing you know empathy and concern, um, confidence, but also acknowledging that we don't know what's going to happen. You know, a week from now, much less a month from now. So uh, very clear about that. Um, that we were all in this together, and we were going to figure it out together. And um, you know, do what we needed to do to serve our customers, but also, you know, take care of our people. Um, and then for North America employees, our CEO for, for this region uh, did almost a weekly uh, message, not quite weekly, um, to all of the North America employees and in similar tone, but just a little more detail about our region and how it affects our, you know, our employees and our customers in our region. And these were both written that both CEOs did the written communication or was no video or? yeah sorry yeah both did written um the CEO in France did uh two or three that were video were delivered via video to employees um and our CEO in North America the first video that he did was really our welcome back to the workplace video um and we were able to get him in the studio and uh and shoot a video with him to say welcome back as we started phase one of, uh, of folks re-entering the workplace. 
how has the, the feedback been, um, well, how, what was the loop, if you will, in terms of even hearing from the front lines, hearing from leadership, hearing from employees, how was that channel handled and what have you heard? We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. Again, um, a lot of appreciation internally on, on the transparency and the frequency of the communication. Um, I think the tone really resonated with people. Um, we tend, we try, we'll strive, I will say, to have that more conversational tone internally. Um, I'm not sure we're quite where we need to be, but this really, we left ahead with that tone. So the tone here to convey that empathy and that we're in this all together and sort of diminishing those lines of hierarchy has mm -hmm. been very, it's almost like a blog tone for our internal communications with our employees and a lot of appreciation for that. Um, people really are engaging with uh, the messages and the content that we're putting, we're putting out there. Um, Customers, we've had really good feedback uh, from our customers who appreciate the fact that we prepared our employees who deployed to their locations, that we had them well prepared to show up at their location. Um, a lot of appreciation for us respecting um, the situation, but also what the utility has put in place for um, protecting folks at their and their, they wanted to protect their communities too. You know, we've got our people going into their communities. Uh, and they uh, needed to protect them as well. So a lot of appreciation there. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of, I think the messages resonated with them quite well in terms of, you know, we're committed to our customers, but we also have to protect our employees and their families and their communities, which is really the same thing everybody was trying to do. So yeah, a lot of positive feedback around that. Um, even the cadence, um, you know, we were doing daily emails to employees there for a few weeks. Um, you know, it was just the coronavirus update. Um, we did suspend some of our normal communication channels um, while we were, you know, doing that every single day um, because it was a lot to get out there. Um, and I didn't hear any complaints. I usually hear complaints from employees. I mean, too many emails. It's too much. And yeah, we didn't yep. get any complaints. Um, and yeah, yeah, you can't over communicate, yeah. especially now. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's, right. that's, you know, reputation building internally and externally, really. Mm -hmm. New York. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So are you evolving or how are you evolving your crisis communication and management plan as, as you move through the pandemic? Um, I think it's a little too early to say for sure. I think I think we'll have more focus on pandemic and our drills um, and our exercises going forward. Um, it's not a, again, it's not a scenario we had played with very much. It was, you know, other things that we had focused on. So I think that will certainly evolve um, over time. Um, I don't know yet quite how that will, when we get back to it, you know, we'll, we'll do a lessons learned. I'm, I'm guessing probably within a month we'll be at the point of doing lessons learned and um, sort of figuring out where we go from here. Okay. What's been one of the most surprising things for you moving through this and, and leading the communications with the, with the team? Um, maybe how fast it evolved. Um, I was just uh, looking back last week at some of our very early messages that went out in the first week before we even decided to move everybody to working from home. The travel advisories were some of the first things we put out. So we started putting out restrictions on international travel and that type of thing before we ever moved to remote work. Um, and I was looking back at those and <laughs> I was thinking, wow, we were so naive. You know, and this is, it wasn't that long ago, really. A couple months, but, uh, how we've evolved since then is, is amazing, but we just didn't know what we didn't know. Exactly. Um, but I think, I think we were flexible and able to evolve very quickly uh, with this scenario. Um, and then again, I think having the right team in place was, was a critical part of that. And we've had a really positive response from our employees, really. That's so powerful. That's your most important audience, obviously. Um, so when you um, when you were taking in the, the feedback and you were hearing lots of positive responses, are are some of the employees already suggesting what 
they see in the future in terms of just the work environment? Um, are they expect, expressing concerns about um, the next normal is what I'm calling it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a survey um, to get input on our return to the workplace plan. Um, so we did a, a lot of benchmarking, of course, and then we sent a survey out to our employees just to say, what do they think about this? You know, how do they feel about coming back to the workplace? What do we need to anticipate in terms of concerns that they may have? Um, and then just their willingness to come back, um, you know, was another big question. And uh, for the most part, um, people are, you know, we asked the question, are you as productive or less productive or just as, you know, or more productive? Um, and the majority said they feel more productive working from, from home. Um, now, we are an engineering company, and engineers tend to be more introverted. <laughs> I think some of them are really They're in like, their happy place, right? They are. They're, they're like, they've been preparing this for forever. They can help us. Exactly. But, um, so I think a lot of them, you know, just, I'm not bothered by meetings. I'm not bothered by people dropping in on me and wanting to chit chat. And mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people feel uh, like they're more productive um, in this mode. Um, most people though, surprisingly, said they didn't want this to be a long-term solution. What most of our employees said they would like is a hybrid solution. So they would like to see themselves working remotely more frequently, um, but not permanently. Um, and I think that that speaks a lot to how we do business. We're a very relationship-driven business, really, um, especially mm -hmm. with our customers. So, um, so that may have been a little bit of a surprise, but um, but yeah. So they've given us a lot of good. You know, we ask, what do you expect when you come back? Um, what would make you more comfortable um, coming back into the workplace? Um, and we listed a few things and then opened it up for suggestions. Um, we got a lot of open comments <laughs> in that one. Oh, that's um, good. <laughs> yeah, a wide range of, of things. And some people were like, I'm ready to come back today. I, you know, it doesn't matter what you put in place. I'm ready. Let's just, let's go. Mm -hmm. um, and some people were like, no, I really want to see the case rate in the state decline before we start coming back. And, you know, I want to see more prevention, sanitation, that type of thing. Um, so a lot of that input went into our plan for bringing people back into the workplace. Um, Great. And we were able to feed that back to our employees. I had a question about um, your crisis team. Were you, um, is this the team that was already set in place? Uh, or did you put together a special team for the pandemic? Uh, it was a team that's been identified more by position or title within the company, I think I would say. Um, so our team that has been working together very closely is a team of six. So we have two people from HR. We have the head of HR who um, is on the team and then someone from her team uh, who works very closely with the part of the business that deploys our folks because that was our um, that was where we had the least stability uh, in terms of um, managing people and movement and communication was in that part of the business because of the nature of their work. Um, so we had those two folks from HR, um, and then we had our crisis leader. He's, uh, he's responsible for our security and loss prevention, um, but um, he, he led our team. He pulled us together and has been leading the team. And then we have myself for communications. We have somebody for policy and government relations who stays on top of what these different states are doing, plus what the federal government um, is communicating for us. And then we had somebody from supply chain um, there because getting supplies, um, I think everybody knows very early on, mask, hand sanitizer, trying to find ways to order that and, and get it in um, was a great challenge in the very beginning. So somebody from supply chain was uh, um, a key part of that team as well. Interesting. And are you still meeting on a regular basis or? We are. Um, we meet every um, day at 8 a.m. for the small team for planning. And then um, we have a team with the rest of the executive staff at 1030 every day. And um, it was interesting hearing Mary talk about their ready to change schedule because we just talked this morning about maybe it's time to go to a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule because we 
those meetings as well. Um, we're in a steady state and um, feeling very comfortable and confident about where we are. Uh, so, so yeah, starting to dial that back a little bit. Okay, that sounds good. Well, we only have a few minutes left. I want to encourage anyone who has a question to uh, feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat. But I would love to hear your three key takeaways, Denise, that you'd like to leave everyone with in terms of moving through this uh, crisis of unexpected proportion. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the first ones is being flexible. Um, you, you know, just being able to adapt quickly, evolve quickly um was key for us uh there was no room for for being rigid about anything really um so staying committed to our key values of course as a company which our first one is safety anyway so that played right into this keeping our employees safe and healthy throughout this but being flexible um being transparent i think we talked about earlier um the being adaptable um and not, you know, as communicators, a lot of times we strive for perfection. Um, and especially because our work is seen by a lot of people. Um, it's very, our work is very visible and we want that to reflect not only us as people, but our companies. Um, but it was very clear very on, this is not the time for perfection, that um, it was more important to get the right things done and the right messages out there. Um, and if it wasn't perfect, then okay, it'd be better the next time. But Absolutely. it was time to let go of perfection, really, which is not easy for, <laughs> for some I of us. Know. Really yeah, easy. we have to like wordsmith and edit, but yeah. gotta get the main yeah. thing is to get the message out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, I think that's it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, I think it's just been incredibly valuable uh, to to hear from the front lines, the lessons from the front lines about the COVID-19 communications response in the energy industry. And so appreciate, appreciate everyone being here. I don't know if Jess has any parting comments, but uh, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jay, for all your uh, contributions and all your work on this as well.